Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Molly. I lead marketing and communications at Rock Health. Rock Health is a full service seed fund for digital health startups based in San Francisco. On top of our startup support, we also host events and publish open source research on the space. This includes our funding database in addition to our Rock reports. Our latest Rock report, The Future of Biosensing Wearables, was released today. It covers a, over a year of re reviewing the wearable landscape, including an overview of the space, how we anticipate products evolving into more specific use cases, and business models for wearable companies in the face of technology giants moving in, including Apple, who made their big announcement last week. Now I want to welcome Malay Gandhi from our team, who leads our research and strategy. He'll be hosting the webinar and providing a deep dive into the report. If you have any questions, please click on the Q&A app button and type your question. Vote up your favorite questions and we'll be answering them live. Thanks Molly and welcome everyone to our first webinar. So today we'll be covering, as Molly said, the future of biosensing wearables. Just a quick housekeeping item, if you'd like to participate in the conversation, as Molly said, you can click the Q&A button or you can also um, tweet at us at Rock Health using the hashtag future of wearables. Let's get started. So the scope of our report was biosensing wearables. What we looked at was at the intersection of biosensors and wearable devices. As you probably know, biosensors take some type of physiological input and convert it to a signal output, and wearables are in or on body accessories that enhance the user experience. Our report was focused on the intersection of both of these areas. So we didn't look at things like the Alive Core device or the Scanadu device because it's not a wearable, nor did we look at wearable devices such as Google Glass or Oculus Rift that aren't specifically designed to be biosensors. So the types of products that we ended up looking at included things we all know and love like Fitbits, Jawbones, and Nike Fuel Bands, activity trackers, as well as smart watches, smart clothing, patches and tattoos, and even including ingestibles and smart implants. Let's dive right into the first chapter of our report covering the landscape of biosensing wearables. So we went out and looked at the space. We looked at a number of different devices, companies, and products, close to 100, actually. And what we've selected here is a sample. What we found and observed is that there is a long tail of products being developed to measure all the physiological parameters of the body. We know that movement, heart rate, and sleep measured generally through accelerometers and either optical or electrical sensors for, for heart rate have now become fully commoditized. They're essentially incorporated into every device and with a thing like an accelerometer are included in all of our smartphones. At the same time, there's this growing long tail looking at everything from ingestion to oxygen to hydration to respiration um, that you know, a number of companies and devices that are emerging to tackle these physiological parameters. With all the development of this space, we know that there's been both a level of hope and hype that has um, come from the press. What we've observed this year is actually a strong backlash against the space. Um, the New York Times, uh, New York Times reporter Nick Bilton going as far to say um, fitness band trackers were digital snake oil. We think the story of the year so far has certainly been um, Nike stopping uh, making wearable hardware, exiting sort of the activity tracker market, continuing on with software. Zio left the space, went bankrupt quite some time ago. Um, it doesn't, doesn't change the amount of hope that's there. Many people believe that wearables are the next computing form factor, uh, and, a, and an analyst, analyst thought 2014 will really be the year that consumers begin to adopt wearables. We think there's more to come this year um, in terms of the products as well as the software. So, the analysts are pretty hyped about the space. We went back and looked at various market estimates. We're not really huge fans of doing the forecasting ourselves, but we thought it was worth rounding up what everyone thought the space could look like over the next um, four to five years, what they thought the market could be sized at in 2018. The largest estimate we saw was from Credit Suisse at $50 billion for the entire wearables market, some of which includes these types of biosensing wearables, but also includes other types of wearable devices as well. And for reference, the smartphone market size today is $337 billion. So most analysts don't really see a market opportunity even as large as, as smartphones. Um, and overall, from a penetration standpoint, this would be you know, tens and millions of 
um, devices being being sold. Today we're at about one to two percent U.S. penetration of just activity trackers. It's not just the analysts who have been um, forecasting large gains for this space. VC is as well. Based on our funding tracking, we've seen the biosensing wearables, biosensor space overall grow by 5x over the last three years. There's some large deals in here, including those for Fitbit and iRhythm. We saw a large deal already this year with Proteus raising another $120 million. So we fully anticipate 2014 will be another large year for the biosensing wearable space overall. Just one small note here, we don't include Jawbone's financing events because we're unsure of how much of their funding is related to their Bluetooth um, audio-based hardware versus the Jawbone Up device. We do know that Up is a fast-growing part of their business, but some of their funding goes towards other activities, so we don't include it here. The active investor list is also a point of interest for us. What we see are a pretty wide range of funds from early to late stage, from healthcare focus to um, tech-focused, as well as a strategic investor in Qualcomm. There's a diversity of investment thesis here from companies pursuing pure medical devices through those that are getting their products onto the shelves at Apple. We think much of this forecasting by analysts and the investment by the venture community has to do with three primary factors that are catalyzing the space today. So the first is related to the device that we all have in our pocket, a smartphone. Today, we're at around 69% US penetration. And for a wearable device maker, to, they can um, handle a lot of the functions of a wearable device through the phone. So the first is the display. You no longer have to have a um, you know, comprehensive display on the device. You can simply send that to your phone through software. Some of the compute power that you need to run algorithms or process data can be done through the phone. And the internet connectivity is also handled through the phone. And a lot of this is enabled through Bluetooth Low Energy, which has enabled a very, very energy efficient data transfer between both devices and, and smartphones. So the offloading is the first component. Much of the um, necessary functions and characteristics of wearable devices can be offloaded to your smartphone. The second area is commoditization. This is also uh, an emergent property of the growth of smartphones. What we see now are sensors and other components that are being used within wearable devices are becoming rapidly commoditized. We went back and talked to folks in the supply chain, and what we heard is that the prices for most sensors are dropping at more than 3% per quarter. For reference, 3% is the you know, industry standard for consumer electronics components. That's the expected rate of decline in pricing, and it's much faster here. If you take, for example, the MEMS accelerometers that are in uh, most smartphones as well as wearable activity trackers, the price today is 25% of what it was five years ago. This benefits the space overall because as um, sensors become commoditized, you know, at things like accelerometers, the sensor makers, companies such as um, Bosch and STEM Electronics, what they go out and do is develop new sensors or they find existing sensors that have been used in various places but not in healthcare and incorporate them into devices. So we get novel sensors and perhaps novel features being built on top of that. The third area for us, and probably the most important because we're talking about biosensing wearables and their impact on healthcare, is this rise of value-based healthcare. So over the last you know, four, three, four years since the onset of the ACA, we're now approaching 20 million lives that are covered under accountable care. This has increased our focus on value-based delivery and preventive care for individuals and consumers. So what we've observed is that health plans and employers who've already established incentive programs that pay for basic biometrics, such as physical activity and weight, are leaning on these types of wearable devices as sources of truth. And James Park was recently quoted as saying that, as saying B2B has become the fastest growing aspect of, of their business. So we know there's a big push to move these devices into the healthcare system, uh, taking advantage of the fact that the incentives have been realigned towards preventive health care. Overall, what we see in terms of the development of devices is that there are literally devices being created today that cannot have existed just a, just a few short years ago. This is um, Spire's new device, one of the Rock Health portfolio companies. And when we broke apart the insides of it, they showed us the inside. What we saw was equipment that simply didn't exist years ago. 
first is this BLE radio that I talked about that allows for all this offloading of, of data. The first device to implement BLE was the iPhone 4S in late 2011. The device also uses a wireless charging coil, which if you follow this space, you know that the two major companies finally agreed to interoperate with each other. But these, these cheap standards-based products only first hit the market in 2013. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, we have very rapidly falling prices for some of the internal components, which allows um, companies like Spire and others to reach a consumer price point. Finally, of course, the device is paired with a software app. And um, the signal processing that Spire does around respiration is quite complex. It's non-trivial. And so they need to offload that computation to the device. And so the data is sent from the sensor in the Spire device. It's sent to the phone, which sends it into the cloud through its internet connectivity. It's processed there and sent back to the phone. Now, to the user, this is all seamless. It seems real time. But realistically, this couldn't have even been done years ago. Um, Spire's product will be available on, on June 17th for those that are, that are interested. Despite all this advancement, taking advantage of everything we've seen um, up, up to this point, what we know is that there's this truth about wearables, that the engagement with end users is difficult. <clears throat> I'm sure many of you listening today know have, have worn or used a, an activity tracker in the past. I've certainly been through most of the devices myself. An Endeavor Partners survey found that the rate of decline you know, is very, very steep during the first six months. Only about two-thirds of people continue to use their activity trackers after that six months, and below 50% by 18 months. We actually think this number is pretty optimistic. We would be surprised if this survey could be replicated using a cohort starting today or devices used today. And of course, an informal survey of our team who all adopted a certain activity tracker last fall, um, about 20% of us remained on after six months. So we know engagement rates, they're probably somewhere in between here. We might be an extreme example. But we know overall the engagement with devices remains quite low. Another issue we've observed in this space is the generic marketing language used by companies. So if you're an average consumer, you walk into the store each day and you look at these kind of top three devices that um, you know, are all over the shelves. We actually recently walked into an Apple and a Target store just to see what the shelves look like for consumers. And we were flooded with Jawbones, Fuel Bands, and Fitbits. You know, that's really what's on the shelves today. Then you get into the marketing copy and you read it. You know, things like Jawbones say it celebrates milestones and challenges you to make each day better. And our big question is, what does that mean to an average person? We don't think you know, an average consumer walks away from this saying, I know how this device makes my life better. And we think this is a big challenge for those folks making these devices is that they've pursued mass market type advertising, uh, very aspirational marketing, instead of working to um, identify specific and narrow use cases. So we have things that are quite generic. When we put that together, you know, this idea of mass market using generic marketing language and the lack of engagement, we think about very traditional product marketing issues. So we started to think about, well, how could these products evolve over time, and how should they be really marketed to end consumers? And the pathway is you know, definitely challenging. If you'll bear with me, I'll try to explain this chart in a couple quick points. So first, when we think about you know, the, the wearable space, what we have on the left are a lot of general purpose devices. And the addressable market for them can be quite small, because as we've shown, the engagement is quite low, meaning the utility per user, like how useful a given device is to an individual user is actually pretty low today. And that's a mix of a product marketing challenge as well as an engagement issue. And so on the far right-hand side, you might see products that are more specialized. They approach almost the feeling of personalization. But you end up in this weird paradox where you provide very, very high utility for an individual user, but that is essentially a niche segment. Of course, most devices want to move somewhere into the middle here, where they, they can reach the mass market and somehow perfectly balance the idea of a general purpose device with a special purpose device. A thing like your smartphone does this pretty well, because it has core functionality that you know and love on top of it and is loaded over the top with a million more than a million special purpose apps. We strongly believe activity trackers exist here on the bottom left today. The product marketing is generic. People don't really know what they're used for. Engagement is very low. So we know the utility is low. If people 
found great value in the devices, they would continue to use them. That's just not what's happening today. And we know the addressable market is quite low at 1% to 2% U.S. penetration. On the other hand, we also see these single-purpose wearables, things like the Reebok Checklight and Lumovac. The fascinating thing about these devices, when we went and looked at them, we went online and started reading reviews. And the five-star reviews are amazing. Things like the Lumovac have you know, the words, it works as advertised. That's something we never saw when we read reviews of Fitbit or Jawbone. You just don't see them saying, works as advertised. We see lots of other interesting use cases, like helped me get you know, more physically active, and particularly with Fitbit, help me lose weight, but not things that say works as advertised. Um, we know that n narrowing in, marketing to very, very specific segments or areas um, really, really benefits um, the, the products and their marketing. Both sectors, both sides of this really want to move up to the top. And what we've observed you know, for the activity trackers is they're rapidly improving their software. They're trying to collect all this data, get people engaged, and improve the insights. And we know over time they'll continue to add more sensors and more features into their product. So if you have a wristborn wearable, there's more things you can incorporate into it. Basis is a good example of a company that's incorporated many more sensors than a simple accelerometer. For the single purpose wearables, they're going to create families of segment specific devices. So instead of trying to make one product meet a mass market, they'll continue to create narrower specific purpose wearables that um, hopefully over time within the family of them will be able to address multiple segments. The next area of our report is really around how we expect biosensing wearables to, to evolve over time. And we see that in three specific areas. The first area is functionality. The second area, reliability. And the third area, convenience. And we think by addressing all three of these areas, if you imagine sort of this, this cube and these three axes, the high value segments will really emerge at narrow use case intersections along those axes. So let me walk you through each one at a high level, and then we'll dive deep into each one and cover some examples of where we think this is being done well today. In terms of functionality, how we think about that is, how do we measure physiological parameters that actually, that actually matter? So they're of value to the individual or potentially even to a healthcare professional. And then more importantly, how do we build software around that to interpret that data, provide insight to the user, and actionable feedback for them to take? This is answering the traditional question, so what? A good example of this is measuring temperature to three decimal places. What's the use of that? Do you really need a red or a green, potentially? What about using temperature for sleep? It's a great indicator. Maybe it's better than using it for, for other factors. The second area for us is reliability. We think this is some, an area that needs a lot of progress over the coming years because healthcare is such a specific use case that demands accuracy and validity. So it's one thing to be able to measure things and sort of hand wave them to consumers and say, hey, yeah, we're interpreting this physiological signal. We think this is great. It's a whole other thing to do that in healthcare. And so we want to see more devices ach uh, see, achieve the accepted clinical standards and receiving an FDA or whatever regulatory clearance or approval they need to be marketed as such. The last area for us is really convenience. And we think this is where most of the market's focus has been today. And that covers it. You know, a couple key areas. The first is form factor. We know that biosensing wearables will exist in a number of form factors. Um, part of that is to enable certain functionality because the body can only be measured um, in certain places in certain ways. But it's also about packaging these sensors into things that are very passive, they're comfortable for the user, and they provide positive reinforcement. Nobody wants to wear something that screams, hey, I have a health problem. They want to wear things that feel comfortable and are socially acceptable. The second area beyond form factor for convenience is certainly battery life and various charging issues. We see this time and time again with, um, with devices when they uh, become cumbersome and they need to be charged frequently, um, they have lower engagement. And then the last area is really syncing. So how do you get data synchronized between your device, the smartphone, and, and the cloud um, seamlessly for the end user? So again, if we think about these three axes, functionality, reliability, convenience, we believe that the high value use cases emerge right at narrow intersections of these three. So not trying to be all things to everybody, but really focusing into narrow use cases. So for functionality, we know that if you don't get to core functionality, you'll never get to um, you know, high levels of engagement with the end user because the utility is so limited. And so we get interested, we get very excited when we see companies that can 
measure physiology in a way that's meaningful to the end user, but it requires such a tight integration between the hardware and software. So it's, again, not just about can you get to an interesting place and measuring and measure a novel aspect of human physiology, but can you make it meaningful to the end user? And a good example of this is Lumavac. It's a it's a novel measurement and monitors your posture and coaches you to improve it, but the, the software reminds you. It's consistent reminders to maintain a healthy posture and it tracks your progress over time. And what we see is that it really drives behavior change and that people over time can actually stop wearing a Lumabac device because they've improved their posture so dramatically. So here's the case of where a sensor directly measures something that's important to the end user, presents that information to them, and allows them to um, take action on it and correct it. It's very different than measuring something, for example, like heart rate and then telling somebody they're stressed out. Well, most of us don't know how to manage our own heart rate. We don't know the actions we need to take because it's a you know, subconscious type activity. <clears throat> the next area, the next axis of innovation for us is reliability. And this really, again, goes back to what segments can we address with our devices? You simply cannot sell into a healthcare market. You won't get a healthcare professional to trust your device. You won't get a life sciences company to utilize your device. And maybe even consumers won't trust your device unless you go down the pathway of achieving a, you know, a regulatory clearance or approval. Healthcare customers simply demand this type of validated data if they're going to incorporate it into clinical workflow. Um, some of the signal processing is very challenging here to overcome some of the accuracy issues because you're measuring from places on the body where you're over-optimizing for convenience and under-optimizing for accuracy and validity. Some of the things that are beneficial, though, are that software can correct for some validity issues. What we observed as we reviewed companies is that few in the category have really received an FDA clearance or approval, but we strongly expect that to accelerate over the coming years. A good example of a wearable device in this space is the Zio patch or Corventus, if you're familiar with them. They have their own patch as well. This is the iRhythm device. It's a single-use patch, so a disposable device. It has a 510K clearance. It's proven to capture arrhythmias for earlier diagnosis, really um, gaining adoption over a traditional halter monitor today. And then it generates a report. The data is uploaded. It generates a report that's sent directly to the healthcare professionals. You know, and this is based on an FDA-cleared um, algorithm. So we think getting high reliability opens up access to these clinical markets. The third and final axis of innovation for us is really around convenience. We believe convenience plays the most significant role in engagement for a consumer, and it's particularly at the onset of use. We know that if you don't have a convenient device, literally out of the box, your user engagement will fall right off a cliff. Um, you have to limit the number of actions. You have to make it really easy to get the product out of the box and up and running. But it's really, really hard. You need to be you know, an Apple-level company. You have to be really good at packaging, industrial design, user experience. And when we went out and talked to the folks at, at Misfit, we spoke with Sridhar Street, Angar as part of this report. You know, everything he described about the choices they made with the device suggested they were optimizing for convenience. So the first thing was get rid of the chargeable battery. So instead, they've used a watch battery that lasts perhaps you know, a few months up to a single year. And I'll say for me personally, um, who was, I was wearing the device, I you know my battery was running low, and for weeks I didn't really respond to the message in the app. There was an in-app notification telling me, hey, your battery is low, you need to replace it. I didn't respond to it. I was planning to just put the device back on the shelf once it, once it died. Because when was the last time I've actually replaced a watch battery? I got an email from the Misfit um, team from customer support saying, hey, if you, need a, if you need a battery, just let us know. We'll send one to you. So that was great. They just mailed me a battery. I switched the one and a, you know, a small um, uh, piece of metal to open the device back up. I switched the battery in and out, and I was ready to go, and I'm continuing to use my Shine today. So they really solved a charging problem where I don't need to continuously charge the device, and they make it really easy to get a new battery. They've used BLE to do background syncing like most devices. Um, you can use it in a variety of different areas. It's waterproof. And then the form factor is one that provides positive reinforcement to the user. And so when we looked at this, it felt, wow, this company has really, really optimized for convenience to the end user, perhaps at um, you know, some loss on functionality and reliability, but really they wanted the early engagement with, with the device. As we looked out into this space, what we found were two examples of companies that have really tried hard to move the ball forward along all three axes. And they end up with very, very high utility. Again, 
narrow use case, um, you know, the intersection of all three, getting narrowed in and focusing in on a use case, optimizing these variables appropriately, we think is where the highest value segments exist. So if you take something like the Proteus, it has a novel type of functionality. It directly measures the ingestion event, and then with a wearable patch also uh, measures activity and heart rate. That information isn't directed towards the person, towards the individual. They know whether they took their medicine or not. They obviously don't need that information. This is sort of the traditional problem of quantified self as it's providing information back to the user that they already know and understand. In this case, that information is provided to somebody who can take action on it, whether it's a healthcare professional or a caregiver. The reliability is there. Proteus um, had a novel regulatory pathway. They received the FDA approval for the ingestible event monitor and a clearance for the patch. And the great thing about ingestion is that it's a binary state of reliability. You either did it or you did not, and Proteus accurately measures that. From the convenience standpoint, the patch is disposable. So you wear it for a couple weeks, and then you rip it off and get a new one. You take your medicines as usual. This is an entirely passive device. You don't have to do any additional tracking. There's no charging on the wearable, and you don't have to enter anything in. The use case here is quite obvious. It's medication adherence, which is one of the largest problems in healthcare, and they're focusing in on key therapeutic areas where a lack of adherence can create significant complications, including heart failure, um, central nervous system disorders, and then um, transplant, post-transplant medication. The other example, more on the consumer side, is Spire. So again, novel functionality here. They're measuring respiration and activity. The thing that's very interesting about respiration is it's something that's actually controllable by the end user. So if you provide somebody feedback on their rate of breathing and make a suggestion of how to change it, perhaps breathing slower or taking deeper breaths, the user can actually do that. And what their research has shown on the Spire team is that respiration is directly linked to state of mind. So it's possible to measure whether you are um, stressed or focused or um, sad or happy through your respiration. So that's the software feedback loop is very, very tight in terms of your, you lack focus right now. We can observe that through your breathing, and here are some clear action steps you can take with your breathing to improve your level of focus. The reliability is very high. It's comparable to a clinical standard spirometer, and this allows them to segment into multiple markets because they've optimized for reliability. They didn't skew it, even though it's something you could probably fudge with the end user. Um, they decided to make a very, very accurate device. And in terms of convenience, they developed it into a form factor that can be worn in multiple places, whether on your hip or in your bra. I mentioned the wireless charging before. There's customized styles so people can feel comfortable wearing them. And the use cases, um, the CEO laid these out last year at Rock House Demo Day, but the first is for health and performance of knowledge workers. So they ran a pilot with a tech company to show um, that they could increase the focus and productivity of the users, which they found 75% of them did while wearing the device. And we think this is, again, because they measure a novel aspect of physiology and they provide that feedback directly to, to the end user. The second area for them, because they've focused on reliability, a new segment emerges for respiratory condition monitoring. So multiple discussions with lots of pharmaceutical companies about companion product, companion device to, to, to um, asthma or COPD, or other respiratory therapeutic area products. We really believe that if companies choose to optimize along these three axes, narrow use cases start to emerge, and these are the ones that are valuable. Continued focus sort of at the low end of the market, not very much functionality, so low utility to the user. It's not reliable or accurate, so it has no chance at a healthcare market. And the convenience being low, whether that's packaging or form factor or <clears throat> um, you know, how you charge the device. If you continue to sit at the lower end of the spectrum, we just don't believe any type of high value use cases will emerge and you'll be stuck sort of in that lower left area of the product paradox. So now for a term that I hate to use but think accurately describes the market. Um, we looked at this space you know, pretty deeply and we were trying to understand what is its progress going to be over time and so if the companies choose to progress down this angle, down ones of functionality, reliability, convenience, enhancing all three, we really see something that does become disruptive over time. So the performance that's demanded by consumer markets, they're mainly looking for convenience and a low price. We know it's very low, and the devices today can hit those pretty easily. Healthcare markets, they're looking for high functionality, so measuring physiological parameters that are of main interest to them, and then high reliability. 
if we look at those markets, medical devices, remote patient monitoring, clinical data capture, employer wellness, there's so many that could use these biosensing wearable devices um, in the face of other sustaining technology today. And we believe that they'll be strongly disruptive to these, to these existing markets. Um, Dr. Osterley at Medtronic tends to agree that it's not going to be the incumbents that he's really competing with, but more technology companies like Google that are developing wearable devices, and in fact medical devices um, today that are in wearable form factors. When we spoke with um, folks at Misfit about this, um, when we spoke with Sri, who also co-founded Agamatrix, what he told us was that what they learned at Agamatrix was seven to eight years of medical, medical, medical. So how do they do something in the medical space, but they were completely hamstrung to update their software, to update the hardware, because there was this huge regulatory constraint. And so he told us that the focus today at Misfit is consumer, and that they would build and iterate in that space, learn as much as possible, move as quickly as possible, learn a lot, and then attack the healthcare and clinical markets, which would directly describe sort of the progress we expect to see for the biosensing wearable space overall. The final chapter here is really around the platforms and business models that surround the space. Um, as you know, there's a very fragmented ecosystem of devices. We laid out our landscape. We've reviewed hundreds of companies. We've also reviewed 100 plus startups over the last year in terms of funding. What we know is that with this proliferating ecosystem of devices, there's many that could solve significant problems for the healthcare industry. And there's critical use cases. We talked to payers and providers and pharmaceutical companies to understand some of these. For, for payers, the really the idealized use cases, which are in effect today, in fact, um, consumer behavior change related to lifestyle and wellness programs, doing early diagnosis and intervention, so supporting biometric assessment, and then really these incentive programs using the devices as a source of truth. Again, all use cases we see um, in play today, and payers are probably the most advanced in terms of adoption of biosensing wearables. But we know they also want to see the performance move up, you know, especially around the aspects of functionality and convenience. For providers, two primary use cases have emerged for them. Remote patient monitoring, of course, creating better devices for monitoring the patients outside of the hospital, extending care from the hospital to the home, as well as support for telemedicine services. So today, most telemedicine services focus on low acuity conditions that can be treated rapidly over the phone. Essentially, the person has self-diagnosed and is then going to a healthcare professional for a confirmatory diagnosis. And um, we see biosensing wearables allowing for much richer data to be provided to clinicians, allowing for um, expanded scope of telemedicine services into um, things that are of a higher acuity. But that functionality of these um, devices, you know, it's great. They need to measure the physiological parameters, but really what's important for this is incorporating that data that's of you know, high reliability, you know, meets a regulatory standard, in integrating that data into clinical workflow and making it easy for clinicians and other healthcare professionals to access um, within, within their existing workflow. For the final area of healthcare biopharma, we see a number of use cases based on our discussions with pharmaceutical companies. Um, you know that the primary ones today exist both on the R&D and commercial side for R&D. You know, capturing clinical data, that's a $6 billion market today just for cloud-based services, growing very, very rapidly. Um, as we move forward with trial design, adaptive trial design is becoming an increased focus of the industry, and being able to collect real-time continuous monitoring data, while a huge challenge, because that's not how data is collected in trials today, would allow for even more efficient clinical trials to be run, not just from a cost perspective, but again on adaptive trials to really um, optimize the, the timing of the trials as well. From a commercial standpoint, we've heard collection of post-market and real-world effectiveness data is of high concerned to biopharma companies to reconstruct their value proposition around new endpoints and outcomes that can be collected you know, in the real world in a post-market setting, as well as exploring combination device and drug, drug products that it could enhance the effectiveness of a given pill. The functionality here, again, must focus on the clinical endpoints, so i.e. measuring the physiological parameters that are tied to specific TAs, and the reliability again, has to exist at this healthcare level, and it needs to pass compliance with existing regulation. There's already, you know, what's known as Part 11 compliance for data capture during clinical trials, and any devices that wish to exist within this ecosystem will need to be compliant with that 
particular pathway. Overall, we see so many use cases for the industry, all focused on the things that we know matter the most, which are improved health outcomes and lower, lower costs. This fragmented landscape of biosensing wearables has really forced a lot of um, companies to think about what's their business going to be? Could they become platforms? And how do they enable these industry use cases? When we spoke with industry players, what they tell us is they don't really want to bet on any particular biosensing wearable device. They really want to allow, one, for consumer choice, but two, not to wed themselves to any given um, platform or device company. And so all of these companies have emerged trying to be the platform for specific use cases, whether it's individual wellness or corporate wellness or consumer engagement analytics or a company like Validic that's purely focused on data normalization and transport. We now have multiple platforms. So we've built fragmentation on top of fragmentation, serving narrower and narrower use cases. We don't know how much ultimately this will benefit the industry, seeing so many companies trying to integrate so many devices. If you look at this landscape on the bottom, what we know is all of the companies tend to platform shop. So nobody is really that committed to any one given platform. They selectively or openly expose their data through APIs, which these companies then ingest, and then expose to their end customers, which also platform shop. They're not really wedded or committed to any given platform either. And so you don't really have the scale on either side of these platforms. And we would say while the use cases are there, they are enabled, the scale is what's missing today from existing platforms. So enter, of course, our friends at Samsung and Apple. Over the last couple of weeks, we've seen announcements from both companies, both seeking to be the platform of choice for digital health. What we know is with this platform shopping um, and the limited scale of existing platforms, an opening is here for these companies. So with Samsung and Apple, they both have a set of enabling devices. We don't know if I, um, Apple is developing a wearable health device. We know they have the iPhone today. They've both built platform technologies on top of it. Apple announced HealthKit, Samsung announced Sammy, and then they also have their own core software apps that track and manage the consumer's health, S Health on one side and Health on the other. And it's notable that S Health does have, in fact, an FDA clearance. What both companies would like is this hardware ecosystem of biosensing wearables, along with non-wearable biosensors, to integrate directly into their platform. And companies, I'm sure, are interested in it because these guys have the scale with consumers that will, you know, this data will get integrated into a core software app. But more importantly, um, these companies have the scale to create a software ecosystem on the other side of it. And so we see mobile apps being developed. And then Apple demonstrated some data transport and liquidity, too, from the healthcare industry, including um, everybody who's on an Epic healthcare system, including Mayo. So, Providers, payers, biopharma all get enabled through these platforms. Again, they already have scale, so they face less of the problem that these new entrant companies do, but still their own challenges that we all know and love from healthcare of integrating this data between the hardware ecosystem and the, the endpoints within the healthcare industry. So we do believe that starting from a scaled platform could catalyze the space in a very different way than existing companies. It's not that it, the existing, the sort of new entrant companies such as Validic or Activity Exchange or anybody else aren't providing value to their end customers. It's just that scale could enable entirely different business models for companies. And so if you think about this core platform that Apple or Samsung in digital health are building with the enabling devices, with the health platform and core software, the first aspect is scale. And so the platform essentially solves you know, an attraction to industry and developers. So even today, if you aggregate all the devices and all the APIs, how do you attract developers onto the platform when consumers aren't really using them? The fragmented landscape at a company like Apple, companies like Samsung, can attract you know, healthcare giants such as Mayo Clinic and UCSF, two Rock Health partners I might note, as well as Epic and Nike um, to develop apps for, for the platform. So that really seeds one side of the platform very well. That feeds back to the hardware ecosystem you know, very, very comfortably. And so for the software companies, they have this huge challenge of fragmentation on the hardware side. Again, companies come to us and they say, well, who should we work with? Who should we focus on? Because there's so many, there's such a proliferation of companies in this space. These pure software players now, you know, which include the healthcare industry, can define these valuable use cases. I think Mayo was showing something of you know, the blood pressure integration, developing a care plan for somebody who has hypertension, 
and they no longer worry about choosing a specific type of wearable. That maximizes their own flexibility as well as consumer choice. That seeds the hardware ecosystem, of course, and for the hardware companies today, our observation about the space and why it's been hard to make investments in it today is because you have to be so good at everything. You have to be a full stack company, if you will. So you have to be exceptional at the hardware, which includes material science and industrial design. You have to be great at software, so creating a really engaging, great user experience that solves a core problem for your end users, and then even integration if you want to work within the healthcare industry. And so now with a platform, a scaled platform, one that's seeded sort of the software side with the healthcare industry, device companies can build once and connect to multiple endpoints through this scale platform and eliminate some of this full stack problem. Ultimately, we see this you know, sort of modularization intermediated by a digital health platform, one that actually has scale as enabling entirely new business, model, entirely new business models for wearable device companies. We think the majority of those include subscription software. So if you're doing patient management of any kind, really the device is a commodity and what you're selling is patient management solution. We see add-on services being sold such as coaching, um, hardware companies being able to move more into disposables. So if you want to be a pure hardware company, how do you really create something that enables your data to come out, goes into a platform and other people build software on it. So you might have an interstitial fluid patch or something like that. You can make a disposable one. People pick up a 10-pack at the store, and then they go out and find the software that they want that's you know, taking advantage of what that sensor provides. We also see high gross margin devices coming out. So if you want to stay as a hardware-focused company, you don't want to sell software, then you work under a value-based pricing model because, again, the healthcare system is linked up here. This really moves the wearable device sector forward in terms of business models. Today, the great majority of companies operate exactly as consumer electronics companies. They're very low gross margin businesses trying to um, you know, make, make a few bucks um, off every device by keeping their cost of goods, you know, their bill of materials very, very low. We saw one subscription software business, that was Body Media, um, and then we see a handful of technology licensing businesses that exist on the hardware only side, and of course those companies that seek traditional reimbursement like iRhythm. We think that a scaled platform could really enable much more to happen in, in the space in terms of business models and free up companies to focus on different aspects of the stack, um, really focus on where they can add value versus trying to own everything, which we know over time will lead to, one, it's led to a lot of fragmentation, but will lead to um, consolidation and, and much failure if it continues this way. So in summary, and we're, we're excited to start taking questions here in a few minutes, in, in just a minute, but um, we think this is very early. It's actually even early to be writing this report. We think the future holds a lot of promise. We know there's going to be much innovation in terms of form factors and functionality and reliability, great access to the healthcare system. We know that there's these problems that the devices can solve, and so we're really here at the beginning of a very, very long journey. And we know that there's been a lot of backlash this year, a lot of pessimism about the space. We're incredibly optimistic about, about the potential as the devices evolve, so we encourage you to, to watch, watch, watch this space as we go forward. And now I think we're going to try to take some questions. So from, from Seb, um, we have a question here. For biosensing wearables, what do you see will need to happen to get reimbursement of these devices and enable much wider adoption? Will they need to go through clinical trials as well? And do we have any examples of companies who have overcome this hurdle? So the answer to your question, I think most of it was answered during, during the session. We think, generally speaking, you need to bridge both worlds today. There's a traditional fee-for-service reimbursement. It's how medical device companies work today. You know, you go through a coverage and reimbursement pathway, demonstrate that you have a clinical outcome, demonstrate that you can provide it cost effectively, and you can get, get yourself a code. Um, there's companies that have done that, Corventus, Zephyr's Biopatch, iRhythm, Proteus, I think I've mentioned a number of these. Uh, Corventus, iRhythm definitely have reimbursement. Um, we don't know if that's necessarily the future. As we said, in terms of new business models being enabled, we see a lot of companies converting to software-based companies. Um, hardware is more given away, it's more considered the commodity, and patient management becomes the focus. So um, absolutely reimbursement is very important for today's world. We see companies getting there and they will need to provide rigorous clinical evidence for that. 
Um, next question from one of our own entrepreneurs. So I'm going to go ahead and take this one from, from Mark and Madison. Mark's asking, clinicians seem interested in prescribing or at least recommending wearable devices. What criteria can they use to ensure that they pick a device company that will be around and grow with their needs? Well, I think this is the interesting thing, Mark, with, with having a platform. Um, trying to bet on which company of all of these companies will succeed is a pretty hazardous approach to um, prescribing something. And I think the best thing to do is find the right platform, prescribe the software, and let the consumer choose the device that's going to be appropriate for them. Overall, one of the other issues that we've observed, you know, just in terms of prescribing apps or prescribing devices from clinicians to consumers is the lack of FDA clearances for many of these devices and apps. So we know that healthcare professionals feel very uncomfortable prescribing. Um, there was a great piece in Reuters recently about the proliferation of things that probably are making medical device regulated claims. And uh, our point of view is provided there, which is that, you know, Apple, Google Play, and others need to do more to flag which things have received an FDA clearance and which have not, so that it's easier for um, healthcare professionals and consumers both to, to sort through those. Another question here, um, how will Biosense, from, from Carson, how will Biosensing wearables help, one, athletes to perform better, and two, patients to successfully change their lifestyle for good? So, it's very, it's very interesting how many parallels we think there are between sort of this high-end sports or athlete segment as well as the clinical segment. We know they demand high reliability. These are very high-performance athletes, and the measurement you need probably is to two or three decimal places. We also think there's very novel physiology to measure with them, you know, that the Reebok sensor related to concussion impact is a very, very narrow use case example, but we think hydration is probably one of the other big areas and potentially blood glucose as well. In terms of the behavior change, we know that um, as, as the companies evolve, they collect more data, they're hoping to intervene on people, provide them useful insights to be actionable. To be honest with you, we don't believe there's some silver bullet for behavior change. We think people are very different, but collecting more data will allow these companies to segment and test interventions that might work for them, hopefully through rigorous clinical trials so that they can prove that they can actually generate a sustainable level of behavior change. Um, from Carly, we have a question. What is our outlook on connecting patient-generated data with electronic health records and how we see this data becoming actionable for doctors? So in our discussions with physicians, you know, the reaction to that is decidedly mixed. We see some clinicians who are excited about the idea of patient-generated data or data coming from biosensing wearables flowing into clinical workflow. From others, they question what the utility of some of this data is. We know that no clinician is going to want to operate on data that comes from untrusted devices. They don't want to make clinical decisions based on trusted devices, and they would probably prefer not to see it in an electronic health record unless it's quarantined from the rest of the care record so they know that it's been generated by patients. O over time, we expect um, significant value there for clinicians in terms of remote patient monitoring, building um, dashboards, and we already see many of those, many of those things emerging. Okay, how about this one from Miles? How can we overcome the upfront expense associated with 510Ks and PMAs to get reliability? but still released to general consumers? Well, that's a marketing claim question. I think you can launch to consumers with a less you know, regulated claim, don't make a medical or clinical claim with the device, get it out to consumers, test, iterate rapidly, and then eventually try to move up market, which is where we see a number of the devices today. Um, how about this one from Taylor? Where does health insurance providers and consumer health companies interacting? How do people enroll and get access to these biosensing wearables, and who's leveraging the data from them providing support? Today, it's largely a function of the platform companies that we outlined. Companies like GIF and Redbrick are good examples of those that are working in the employer wellness space, working al alongside um, health insurance companies as well as employers. Ultimately, you know, consumers have their choice of device. They bring them to work, and they get rewards and incentives. That particular use case, tracking of people, isn't one that consumers necessarily will adopt at wide scale, but employers do want in terms of being able to um, track their incentive programs and have a verifiable source of truth for, for biometric data. Um, 
here's a fun one from Kevin. How do we get Rock Health up for a visit to Ottawa, Canada? Um, I think you should send us some hoodies, and we can we can consider it. Send us some warm some warm gear. I'm looking for questions. Just bear with me. So Jerome, excuse me if I said your name wrong, is asking, what kind of wearable startup would Rock Health be interested to take into their um, into their accelerator? So the types of companies we're interested in funding now after having looked at the space are those that can provide an order of magnitude improvement along those dimensions that, that were outlined in the report. So we are looking for companies that measure novel physiology, make it extraordinarily useful to the users. So we literally want to see an order of magnitude improvement in terms of engagement and weekly and month over month return rate over existing devices. We want to see order of magnitude improvement or reliability because we want access to clinical markets like our partners want and we think where a lot of the value is going to be um, accrued. So order of magnitude improvement and reliability, so having a really great sensor and then you know, some, you know, some solves and software to make it even more valid and, and accurate. And then finally, convenience. You know, we want to see things that consumers love and adopt and will we'll gladly wear. So order of magnitude improvement along those dimensions and it can come through a variety of different mechanisms. It might be a hardware breakthrough, might be great software, might be great um, clinical partners, but what we really want to see is massive improvement along those dimensions because we think ultimately getting into those narrower use cases will provide a lot of value and create ultimately large companies. Bart's asking, where do we want to aggregate all the data generated by these devices in one central in one central record? I don't know. There's a lot of bets being made in the space today of where those things should be aggregated. Apple and Samsung are betting that people want to aggregate all this data for themselves and then provision its access to other companies, including their healthcare professionals and clinicians. We've seen challenges with this. We've seen, you know, personal health records and other things, consumers not necessarily wanting to be the custodians of their data. But as we enable more passive tracking, large hardware ecosystems and very specific use cases that communicate value to consumers, maybe we'll see more personal tracking. In the meanwhile, we have a lot of companies that exist to, to collect this data on your behalf as well. Julian asks, how do you think platforms Samsung and Apple are launching fit in relative to activity trackers for single purpose devices you discussed on slide 13? I'm glad, I'm glad that you asked this question. So, we really see um, that curve, you know, of the general purpose versus the special purpose devices as a core product problem. So if you were developing a product, and I say product very distinct from a platform, um, you have to face that type of trade-off. If you're Apple and you're launching a platform, you don't suffer from this problem. I think the big issue that they will face and Samsung will face is what is the core functionality of a wearable device if they so choose to launch one? So what features do we include, i.e. what sensors, what functionality do we include, so what physiology do we measure, how do we make that meaningful to the end user, and how do we tell a significant consumer product story around this device and um, get adoption? From there, with the platform, they can enable millions of specialized use cases. This creates you know, that long tail of sensors and hardware companies that we saw are all immediately enabled by a scaled platform existing. And so just like we have mobile apps, we could have mobile sensors, mobile health sensors that exist around these ecosystems. And ideally, that platform would perfectly balance sort of a core set of use cases if, again, Apple or Samsung chooses to launch one of their own wearable devices. How do you create something that's core? Um, and then through the platform, enable much more specialized, narrow use cases, which is sort of what we've seen with smartphones today, they address the core communication issue, whether that's with other people or with the internet, but then now millions of special purpose apps designed to let you reach much more niche, niche segments.
Let me try to take one or two more questions here. Sorry, just searching. Kelly asks, what's the barrier for widespread consumer adoption so we can address chronic disease and slow aging? So, Kelly, I would say the thing that's um, the large barrier for widespread consumer adoption, I don't think it's price. Um, we walked in. We don't think it's access. We walked into Target and Apple. There's tons of devices on the shelves. We think the products just aren't good enough quite yet. We don't know that consumers directly understand that you can address the chronic disease with it or you could potentially, I, I don't know about slowing aging, um, I know about improving lifestyle. The companies just don't seem to market their devices that way. That could be for regulatory reasons or otherwise. They just can't really make those those types of claims. So we know consumers, they're accessible to consumers, but the adoption is low. We see that largely as you know a function of not having enough evolution along these axes of functionality, reliability, and, and convenience. You know, and if they want to make that type of marketing claim that, hey, this can help you with your chronic disease, run the trial and prove it. Um, Cole is asking about technologies in the field of mental state and mood disorder diagnostics. I mean, it's pretty interesting. There's you know, 8 to 12 core physiological parameters that can be linked to mood and mental state. Um, respiration is a good example of one. We mentioned Spire. I think you should check that device out. Um, Numitra is another company in our portfolio that works on stress, and Empatica is another one that's looking at mood and, and mental health. But in general, we just haven't seen the devices. The sensors exist to um, track the right physiological parameters that could be associated with state of mind or mood. We haven't seen necessarily the companies packaged and marketed in that way. And I think um, you know, stay tuned for Aspire's launch on June 17th to see more about that. So I think we've gotten through most of the, the popular questions for today. I want to thank everybody for joining our webinar. And I would be remiss if I didn't um, thank our industry partners who support our work every single day and provided feedback on this report. We were very fortunate also to talk to a number of industry experts from uh, retail buyers through supply chain experts, folks in pharma, folks at startup companies, investors, and getting their time and insights. And of course, thanks to our amazing team, Molly, for um, planning and executing this whole webinar and kicking us off, as well as the rest of the Rock Health team. Um, in particular, Teresa Wang, who's sitting right beside me but hasn't said a word the entire time, uh, co-authored this report alongside me, as well as Sonia Haveli, who was our, um, our, our primary researcher for the report. So thanks to the Rock Health team. And again, thank you all for joining us on this webinar today.